Good morning. We're here with Ivana Taylor. Ivana, can you tell us what you do here in Chicago and how your spiritual journey began, please? Uh, sure. Hi, um, Ivana Taylor. Uh, I am a my official um, work professional um, identification is that I'm a managing director uh, with the with Accenture, which is a large global uh, technology and strategy company that um, does a lot of the work in terms of um, AI, um, all of the things that are kind of currently in the news and in the future. So something that I do professionally, uh, but my spiritual journey, uh, what's interesting about, I guess, that question more so is that uh, it's something that I think like most people when growing up, you have some kind of religious ex influence and experience through your family uh, that starts on a path. And it's something that what's interesting about that path is that it was probably more more through my grandmother than anybody else. Um, she was a deeply spiritual woman and deeply uh, religious in the sense of, of some of the traditions and the cultural aspects of it that were important. Uh, we're, we're Serbian Orthodox, which is like Greek Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox. It's, it's, it's Christian um, Orthodox in faith. Um, <clears throat> but it's really more about her approach to so many things. And in some ways you think of them as maybe a little bit superstitious or um, some of those kind of old world cultural things that she would do that then just became a part of my subconscious programming more than anything. Um, and that's probably where it started, but it's certainly the, the journey that it's been on um, as I started to grow older and, and think more broadly, I started to really think about spirituality as more of a philosophy of living, um, probably more so a roadmap or a set of principles, kind of existential, more existential um, answers to questions that are could be every day and questions that are actually really fundamental. And, and when I say that, I mean is you know, I start my day through kind of a ritual, um, through a um, a prayer of sorts. It's changed. It's evolved. It's a meditation. It's a, a blessing. It is a, it, you know, it is calling every morning that I'll, I'll start with that ritual uh, to just connect to the divine, um, to connect to um, the best version of myself, the best version of where I'm hoping to um, pull into my current reality. So visions of what I'd like to do, everything from professional to personal to people I love, um, sending them blessings, um, protection, all of those things are just a way that I kind of start my day. It's part of my every day and, and my every evening as a close. And it's just a way to punctuate time for me. So when the day starts and the day ends, it's kind of like everything you do in between. And my hope is to feel connected enough to something divine so that it can help guide me through my decisions and choices and, and things that are even work things uh, and how I treat people and how relationships that I have, personal things with my husband and family. And then even broader existential questions about why something might have happened to try to put it in context, or at least try to navigate with grace and divinity through things that maybe are very challenging um, is part of, I think, the way I've come to accept spirituality in terms of my everyday. So talking about challenges, because of, I mean, um, for all transparency, I know you very well. You're a very good friend of mine, and I really admire you. And um, we've discussed before that we're going to bring this up in this conversation. You've had faced some extraordinary challenges in your life. And I think people listening would be really grateful to hear about those and how you, it's not that you overcame them, how you were able to view them in a light that was made you feel safer in this world because if you could talk about that that i'd be i'd be really great and i'm sure people listening would be um yes and of course the 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 immediate um <laughs> the immediate person in in my life that that really took me on this wild ride of a spiritual journey is my my brother uh my brother john was 12 and a half years younger than than me 
Uh, he was um, the golden child, even of, of my cousins. He was uh, the, the, the son that like my parents had always prayed for. He was um, a, a joy and a light and a, um, a spirit that in human form that was somebody very divine. And um, we really became close because because there's such a long, large age gap, we really became close as he got further into adulthood. Um, he, um, before his 30th birthday was diagnosed with a um, very aggressive form of cancer out of nowhere. It was a, a adrenal cancer that um, had no explanation, had no rhyme or reason had no, um, it, it, there was no sense to be made out of it. It's, it's a very rare one, one in 2 million a year, get it. Um, it's, and it, and it took us on a journey. He had just, um, he was one of the smartest, brightest, funniest people I knew. He had just, um, started his job. He was an investment banker. He had finished, uh, his, uh, master's degree at university of Chicago, where he had met his, um, fiance, um, and fallen in love and, and who's somebody who is now my sister. And he was just starting his life. And he was right before his 30th birthday, he found a mass. Um, and <laughs> I, he had an eight hour surgery. It was, it, it started us on a path of three years of just watching him battle, um, watching him suffer, struggle, and ultimately um, with my sister-in-law, Stephanie, um, guide, it, being there with him as he passed on. And it was the, um, it was the most difficult thing I've ever been through so far in my life. And even I've, even since then, I've had people that I've loved past, but it was like, you, you know, it's, you never, your first time, you know, you, you never, you know, your first time is always uh, the most difficult because you really start to understand um, what love really is and, and, and that intertwining of love and loss that so punctuates that experience that it, it, it really caused me to question everything. It caused me to question um, the meaning of life, it caused me to question because in so many ways, I realized that my my interpretation of kind of the way the my structure of the way the world works and based on spiritual teachings was that karma was real, like good things happen to good people and, and really holy, great people um, are spared, right? Because they do good things. It was very karma in a very literal sense that, and this is something that I grew up with, talk about, you know, kind of subconscious programming through my family is that we're good people, we do good things. And, and it, there was almost a judgment on when bad things would happen, like there was an explanation of like, they somehow it happened because they did something wrong. And that was just a massive reckoning accounting of the universe of karma. And it really, because, and the reason why it was such the perfect example for this thought process, because my, my brother was one of the best people I'd ever known. Like he really was goodness. There was not an ounce of, of, of anything but goodness. He was funny. He was brilliant. He was smart. He did all the, we did all the right things. And even in this journey to save him, uh, you know, the secret that you, you name it, we were, you know, he was, he did everything. We went alternative medicine. We, we tried every thing we can think of power, positive thinking. Like if that was that alone is the answer there's, it would have, everything would have worked. And, and so here's, it, it threw everything into question for me. And it set me on this path of you know, the whys, <laughs> the anger, the, the five stages of grief, um, where you, you look around and you're like, oh my God, there's these, there are people around me who are not as good people and they're here and he's not. And, and all the, the stages of, of that you pass through, um, is fascinating because you start with anger, you start with, well, you know, you, and, and there's resistance and you're, you're building walls and you're like, there, there's this journey of your heart is so crushed that the subconscious part of you is about build a, building walls and it's really about building a wall around your, your heart because you know literally the subconscious thought process you go through is 
I can't survive another one of these. So I'm going to start building walls to protect my heart. And I'm going to start building walls so that I can't be hurt like this again, because it's such a natural self, um, uh, preservation instinct. It's your instinct is to fear. Fear creates walls. It keep, creates. And, and what I realized was so that the, the next lot it's, and it's logical because I don't, you know, I cannot survive another one. If my, one of my children goes through this or my husband or somebody else I love so completely, like I love my brother, if I were to, I can't go through another one of those. So you start to build walls, but what, what that means is that you start to distance and you start to put space between you and people you love because you, you're so afraid of being hurt again. But the, the, the interesting thing about that concept is in some ways by doing that, you, you create a, a, gap between you and the people you love and then they start to see you in a different light and you actually might cause the thing you fear most which is ultimately losing someone you love and because you become cold you come distance because you're you're just trying to protect you don't even know you can't put it in words until you do all the deep work of really trying to understand what is going on and you might create the thing you fear most which is where I really, the, the, the change for me started when I really started to think about this concept of there are only two ways to walk in the world, out of fear or out of love. And what that means is fear is about protect, um, fear, fear about defend, resist. Fear is about putting up all the things to protect yourself versus letting go <laughs> of fear and knowing or acknowledging it saying i see this fear like literally that was the mantra that was part of the process for me which is i would literally when i feel the fear when i see the fear when i notice it in big and small ways i would literally have a mantra that i would just go to and which was i see this fear and i'm choosing love instead and i'm opening my heart and i am going to put down the walls i'm going to love more and whatever that means um it opened up a whole different relationship with my husband with my children uh with my family with my friends um i let go of judgment because judgment in a lot of ways is so rooted in fear judgment is so um it, it is it, the fundamentals of judgment are fear and, and when you judge others it, you know, it's really looking at what is it about me that is being triggered or being, it is afraid of what I'm seeing and judging in others, because it's actually always easier to judge someone else than it is to look within, to say, what is it about me? And, and, and a, just a simple example of that is, you know, I would have profound judgment around, like, let's say I see plastic surgery and I'd be like, oh my God, that's so it was just such a, a visceral judgment of seeing people who had taken particular path and seeing like, oh my God, that looks ter so terrible. And I started to think about it, like, well, what is it about me that is so fearful of that? And I think I'm like, oh, at the end of the day, it's about death and aging. It's about loss. Right. And, and I finally, I'm like, oh, they're just, we're, we're all dealing with the same thing. And it's this coming together and this connection to the oneness within us all and, and simplifying things so that there is no more bridge. And when I judge someone else, um, it is it is a reflection of me. It is a reflection of what I'm struggling with. And, and rather than fixing something that's out there, the answer always is fix what's here. And, and, and look at that as a mirror for what it is that you need to work on. And there's so much symbolism in terms of my brother. Um, he was 33 when he passed away, which was the same age as, you know, there's, you know, Jesus. And there's so much 33 symbolism that is fascinating to me. There's so many of those things that um, have come up and that really put me on this path of, um, writing a novel, which is not something that I, I think when I was young, I really thought that that was something that was on my list of things that one day I would love to do. Um, but I, I was busy with a career and busy with, you know, um, finance and math and all sorts of, you know, kind of stuff that I love. 
and um, really never, never really took the time or, or really had the time to say, I'm going to write this. And I think what was interesting about that journey um, of my brother's journey um, is that actually that is the path to healing ultimately for me, which was to actually write a novel. And the, 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 and it was not about a novel about helping someone deal with cancer because it was not, it was so much bigger than that. It was a novel about, it was an existential question about um, the, the theme of it is an investment banker turned painter trying to understand the value of art. And the reason what it really was, was me trying to understand the meaning of life from the perspective of, I was a math person. I'm a, I'm a very logical person who is linear in my thinking, logical, you know, and, and it's somebody who also has this part of me that is very, um, creative and is very in, inspirational. The word in, inspire comes from this, you're touched by something bigger, right? And it's this, it's, it defies logic and it's not about logic and math and numbers. And yet there is this whole field of math, of quantum physics, where you start to see a lot of fascinating connections where the, the, the it's math 101 level is very linear, but when you start getting into very complex math and physics and quantum physics, it starts to get very almost spiritual and imagination and creativity are very much a part of that, that realm that I just didn't understand. And so the, the journey of the book is really about somebody who is, lives in this world as math, you know, very logical, rational, mathematical, trying to understand something that it defies math and logic and reason, and which is inspiration, which is art, which is creativity. Why do we respond to a piece of art? Why does it make us feel a certain way? Why do we connect to an artist that maybe is no longer living, that we, we there's some kind of unifying thing that we, that resonates. And it's this um, fascinating meaning. I was trying to really understand the meaning of life and, and what it came down to it, you know, as, and I even have a chapter called algorithms and bots, which is, you know, very much gets into some of the math and engineering technology pieces of it, which is, you know, part of, of something that I am very interested in is something that I do professionally all the time, but it's this idea of, you know, we can solve problems. One plus one is two, but when you really have to when that no longer serves you or that no longer can, you know, define the all of existence, you really start to explore a, a different math. And, and I, the way, the simplest way I can explain it is one of the things that, that when I, you're an art student and one of the things that, one of the things that a professor will do was they'll draw two lines on a, on a piece of paper and they'll say, how many lines are there? And you're like, two. And the answer is actually three, because there's the negative space in between the lines. And it's one plus one is three. And, and it is this profound perspective changing thing. It's actually, it's, it's, and it's, it's almost like, you know, the, the matrix when they talk about, um, you know, it's not, it, there is no spoon, right? There's the, that famous scene of like, it's you that changes. And that to me was a part of that journey, like the value of art, it, it's spiritual. It, it, it really gets to connecting to something bigger, connecting to something divine. And in some ways it was, it helped me connect to my brother who is no longer here physically, but he is with me in my heart. He's with me in my children. I see it in, in his humor. And my, when my children will say something, it'll remind me of them. And it's this, this ability to understand that we are it, it, there's so much more than we can just see with our five senses. There's so much more that if you can do practices, things, um, write books, make art, um, meditate, do those things that can connect you to something bigger than we can see and hear and taste and touch. That is time well spent on this earth. And that will connect you and let you see things through you know, something else through other senses that are, that are divine. So listening to all of that and you going on this 
extraordinary journey because by writing it, you're also writing, weaving your story and your learning about how to deal with grief into this. If you look at yourself before your brother had the cancer to where you are now, how do you think all of that shifted you? Do you feel more satisfied with life, happier, not because of obviously his death, but because of what you went through? Is there more value to what you, how you see your days? If you could explain that. So I think the easiest way for me to explain that part of it is that, as I said, I was a math person, you know, as finance, I did my master's, all of that. I was a perfectionist um, in the truest sense of that, that I found, found great comfort in, in perfection in doing the right thing and doing the right, you know, doing cer certain things a certain way. Um, what's so interesting about perfectionism is that there is an implied certainty. There is an applied certainty that you can solve the, the problem, that you have all the answers, that you can come up with, you know, the number is 42. <laughs> there is this just certainty that, that that's implicit in perfectionism. When something happens that is so fundamental to kind of destroy all of your structures of you know, when, when everything you do, you do it all and you cannot solve this puzzle. We could not save my brother. We could, we did everything. There was this, um, I guess, awakening to the fact that I, I don't have all the answers and that's okay. And that's okay. And, and my vision of how something is supposed to be and my certainty, my certitude in that, that that's how it should go isn't necessarily the right answer. And the the simplest thing I can relate to how it's changed me, it's changed me as a mother. It, it's, it's, I've done a 180 in how I approach my children because um, I was really, really, and part of it was my growing up and part of the ex high expectations and all of that, but I was very certain I knew what the path should be for my children and what the answer was and my expectations. And <laughs> I think I have letting go of that certainty and actually having a humility to listen to maybe what, you know, maybe it's not what I planned, but what they need and who they need to be. It shifted me from being a parent who believed in the perfection formula and what they needed to be to a parent who really looked at who they were and what they needed to be perfect in their own way and not my definition. And, and I guess the, 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 when I say that, how that it's, it's released me in so many ways from having to um, be certain and, and having to have all the right answers and just trusting more in terms of the divine, and trusting more in terms of the bigger plan, trusting more in terms of their own unique manifestation of the divine, which may not be exactly what I think it is or should be. I, I've given away, I, I've, I've just let go of a lot of should. I've let go of a lot of should and, and um, welcomed um, what can be. And that gets to the whole idea of who am I in my small body and, and limited mind and senses to know all the possible manifestations of the divine that could happen. Like, why am I limiting that based on my perception of what should be. And that, you know, there, there's so many pieces to that. There's forgiveness, there's letting go. There's, there, there is just letting go what you think should happen so that you can welcome something bigger, something better, something different. And why is it that we have to limit um, just based on what we know versus allowing the divine to take a bit more of the of the steer, steering wheel for where we're going. Um, and that, you know, opening to bigger, 
and, oh, and, and helping my children open to bigger and helping them trust themselves on this journey in a way that is less controlling because perfectionism, judgment, these are all controlling things that are rooted in fear. And I'd really want them to feel love and an unconditional love that is nothing about judging their path or judging their, their, because I don't know, like, we don't know, you know, is something good or bad? It's, it's that famous, um, you know, it, there, there's so many famous things in Buddhism that talk about, like, how do you know if it's bad? Or how do you know that this isn't the path? How do you know? Um, and, and it's that, that like being comfortable in the not knowing, being comfortable in the allowing to, for something bigger to enter where you might have just had a very small and limited vision of what it could be. I love that. I'm on the journey with you thinking about all these thoughts, I have to dissect them. I love it. So as you were talking about this, um, there is a part of your story where there was more trauma where your mother died, I think two years later, and then your grandmother, I don't know which way around it was, but so you lost three of the most important, apart from obviously your children, husband, or the most important people in your life every two years. So how how did you cope with that? Is that where you really started just realizing that the only thing to do was surrender? So... I remember, so my mother, um, and, and it's a complicated journey because my mother had melanoma that went into remission. And then when my brother became sick, he, uh, her, her immune system, I mean, she was, it was such a shock and stress that I think the cancer came back because her immune system just shut down with all the stress. And I remember like it was two years to the day there I was, and I was crying to the doctor who was this very kind man. And it was the end. And it was like, there's, you know, we were looking at one more, you know, clinical trial, one more thing that we could try. And he just looked at me and he just said, look, there comes a time when you have to, um, when it's, it's not, it's selfish to keep trying because I was, you know, never give up was part of my DNA. And I remember sitting there with him and I was, we were outside the room. My mom was in, in the room and, and I said, I, this is like Groundhog Day. I'm like, here I am again, like two years, you know, two years again, like it was yesterday. I just go, went through this with my brother and here I am again. And I'm like, I, and what was so interesting and, and, and there it was. And then two years later, my grandmother um, as well. And, and I, there's one thing, and this is where, you know, it's such an interesting thing when you find sp certain spiritual people that say things that are so meaningful. When my brother passed away, the priest that was there, he was actually his, my brother's age. And I still know him. He's a lovely, lovely person. He was an Orthodox priest, had a family and, and, and he was saying this, you know, they're just moments of comfort when people say exactly the right things. And he had said during my brother's my brother's funeral he said that there was he was telling the story about this this mother who had three sons um and the um his uh, her first son had passed away and it was during the war and she was destroyed and her second son passed away he was she was also destroyed and by the third son to pass away all she said you know was you go with god and it's, it was a, some, it ended up being a similar journey for me, which is this surrender, this letting go to what is in a way that now they're everywhere for me. They're with me in everything. They are no longer limited by a body or by time or space, but they're in my heart. They're my soul. They're in, in my gifts that I pass on to my children. There are, are, are times when I'll play cards and it's my grandmother that is with me. And it, those are, those are moments that, and there's a, there's a, um, a movie called Lucy and it's just this super interesting kind of matrix like movie. And it really at the end, when someone dies, they're everywhere. And that is that shift for me. 
of, and of course I miss them. Of course, I wish I could have a conversation. Of course, I wish I could have them here um, to, to see my kids, what, what they're doing now. They would love it and all of those things. But I, they are here and they are with me and they're with me through my children. They're with me and through my every day. And I carry them. They're my army of, of love. And it's, it's just um, something that I don't know you can't, you can't conceptualize it, but when you meet people who have gone through these things, you, you, you understand it and you, you connect on it and you're able to uh, share it in a way that you would not be able to do had you not gone through this, this journey and this war and this, <laughs> this, this dark time to be able to drop your defenses and know that the only path out of this is more love and it's unconditional love. And it means not to love less, but to love more and to love everyone and just see the divine in everyone that you, it's not, time isn't linear when it comes to those things. Oh, that's so profound. Um, so just, I'm just gonna, ask only a few more questions because I think we've covered so much important information this huge epic undertaking sort of spiritual evolution that you've gone through through to deal with everything and also writing it into your book that I really look forward to at some point entering the world um how do you think this journey affects you when you work with your colleagues with this lack this sort of non-judgmental approach this this non-perfectionism approach how how does that affect a job that you have to do right because this is something that i struggled with a lot because when i was holding on to my perfectionism my judgment and all of those things it really was from a place of like, well, if I don't have that, how will I achieve excellence in something I'm doing in my job or in my school? Or how do I not drop all standards for my children? Like the expectations of, you know, them doing great things. And, you know, it, it's actually really subtle and it's very simple. And it's just a small shift inside, which says, are you sharing this piece of feedback as a reproach for something they did wrong or is it in the spirit of making them better? And it's it really is what is the intention and the energy around it, that feedback. And it's not always gonna be glowing. There are times when it, the feedback is gonna have to be very clear and, and, you know, come across as negative, but what is the energy behind that feedback? The energy behind that feedback can be one of just, you know, just complaining and, and just, just, you know, tearing someone down because they did something wrong or the energy of that feedback could be about, here's how I think you can shift so that you can rise and so that you can do better and what you need to do. And when it, and it, I think love is probably the only <laughs> thing I know to call it, but if there is that, my love of wanting to you, for you to be better, it's a whole different energy around the feedback that you're giving, because we all do need to do great things and we do all need to do, you know, we need to solve problems. I I'm in the problem solving business. I need to figure out good, the right answers, but I can do it in a way that is very different and feels very different receiving it as well, which is about, it's not about, you know, just punishing you for doing something wrong. It's about helping you to do something more and helping you to, to do something bigger that maybe you even didn't think you could, but it's about guiding and, and that servant leadership is the word that, you know, you often hear it's about being in service of making someone better as that shift. And that is probably subtle, but it's everything. It's, it's everything about how it feels to give and how it feels to receive. Amazing. Um, if only everybody worked like that, the world would change. Um, and that's why we're doing the show. So we come up with lots of ideas about new ways of thinking, how to live in this world that 
we can implement that actually makes sense and work. Um, so thank you for that one. Um, so I'm going to end this now with one more question. And I've been asking lots of people this, and I really like to hear all the different answers. Uh, is what do you want to see more of in the world? What would you like to see more of? Oh, I would love to see more humility. <laughs> I would love to see more uh, openness to talk to people who think very differently than you. Um, I think we've lost a bit of that. I think we've lost... Uh, a bit of our patience with people who think differently. Um, I think we've lost our our interest in learning why someone might have a position um, that they they hold. Um, I I some humility and some peace and and really discourse and discourse that that is not about. And I remember this is one of the things that I remember when Donald Trump won in 2016, there was at, yeah, I think it was the University of Pennsylvania where all of a sudden there was, they had put up a wall that said, what questions do you have? Like, why could, you know, it, it, like it was such a surprise to so many people at the time. And it was this curiosity and 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 wanting to understand what why people maybe thought differently um and it was this this they did a wall and everyone could post the questions their questions and i just i love that spirit that i feel like now it, it's we're so um totalitarian in our acceptance of our perspective we're such per perfectionists in our own mind of how we think things should be um, that we need a little bit more of, of coming back to the humility of understanding and the curiosity of why someone might think differently because it actually might make us think more broadly. Perfect answer. And I thoroughly agree. And um, I want to say thank you very much. I love this interview and I learned a lot and I it was wonderful. Thank you. I can't wait for the show. <laughs>